Hello and welcome back to Curiously Polar. My name is Chris Marquardt and with me is Henry. Uh, well, I have to point this way. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, you might get the idea that we are again recording an episode, not just for the audio podcast, but for the video side of things. And here we are. The penguin is back. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not <a> penguin. <laughs> And and uh, we also fixed the uh, networking issues uh, last time. Um, again, some apologies for last time because we had a few dropouts here and there. But this episode, I'm not going to wood here, is going to be uh, rock solid, right? Will it? Good. Yes, it will. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Henry, how are you today? I'm great, apparently. Um, yeah, pretty amazing weather, pretty amazing times. Um, how are you? Oh, very good. Now the neighbor has stopped mowing their lawn and <laughs> everything is quiet again. So <laughs> this is this is the problem when you don't have one of these broadcast uh, treated uh, sound treated studios with big walls and uh yeah. Anyway, that um is not what this show is about. <laughs> we uh we had originally planned to continue the Voices of the North series for today, but um there's still some work in the pipeline. Um you're still uh gathering some audio for that. So Yeah, the thing and is it's not your fault. This, it's not your the fault. The series works amazingly because we get some sound snippets of those uh, traditional songs and also, um, contemporary songs, how they mix that and um, clearing that apparently takes longer than expected. And yeah. even though we change to a bi-weekly uh, bi rhythm now, um, it doesn't seem to be enough time to get some permissions here and there. So yep. um, unfortunately, we have to postpone that for at least one more episode. Um, and we're just dropping in a more current topic. Yes, you would, you'd be surprised how much work has to go into, into some of these episodes. So... Yeah, anyway, um, but we have we have plenty of other things to talk about, and one of those is the Svalbard Treaty. Indeed. So we're just repeating episode thirty-five, which is playing it straight <laughs> from the archive. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are not. No, we are not, because there's uh, there's new new things on the horizon. So um, you brought us some exactly some current and super exciting things. So maybe a quick recap. What is the Svalbard Treaty for those who have joined the episode after 33? 35. Uh, episode 35. Um, it's a treaty that rules the sovereignty over Svalbard and not only the sovereignty, but also who is allowed to live and work there and who can use the resources uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's the Svalbard Treaty. For everyone who has no clue what Svalbard is, it's an um, archipelago in... Let's put the... it on the map. Oh, beautiful. I love the bathymetry map. That's just <laughs> amazing. What For map? Everyone... What? The bath what? Explain that. Bathymetry. Please. Bathymetry. That's like the the ocean floor. That's, that's That shows you how the ocean looks like oh. under the... And how the floor looks under the ocean, and we can't see that. Like so a we actually continent shaped thing down there. It does, and we have a top view here. So y this area usually is covered with ice, so that's sea ice. We can't see anything there, uh -huh. and um, now we can see actually how the bottom looks like. And we can see we have two big basins. We see Greenland. That's the big white on okay. the island with a big white cover um, on the bottom left, and. On the right side of Greenland, we see a group of islands with a couple of white dots. And you mean that the ones I'm zooming in Svalbard. right now? Yes, exactly. And that is Svalbard. And Svalbard um, lies on a plateau, which is not really... Not, it's not really agreed on if that is part of the continental shelf coming from... Um, from Norway or if it has its own continental shelf because you actually have between Norway mm. and um, Björnøya that's the tiny little I island south of Svalbard um, you can see there is a little um, decline there is a little trench and that trench is called uh, Barents through and that Barents through is for some geologists um, evidence that Svalbard has its own continental shelf some say that's not enough of an evidence. 
Mm, However, okay. we see here actually how Svalbard is situated within the Arctic, uh, exactly at the act edge of the Arctic Basin. Um, you see that the Arctic Ocean forms this deep basin up to four, four and a half thousand meters deep. And that's the dark blue areas. And, and by the way, um, when, when you say uh, the, uh, the Buren Island being south of Svalbard, um, what we're looking at is a look at the planet from the top so everything that points away from that northern thing <laughs> is southward so even upwards on this map uh would be going south because it uh goes away from that center point which is the north pole this is completely it, true it, it, yes. it's very disorienting it, disorienting to look at a map that doesn't show it's very our, unusual. our general yes. projections you know so yes very unusual to see the the world from the top view yes but when you when you take the, the the bottom tip of this um uh of the main island spitsbergen mm. and you just draw the line towards norway then you just see the island yes which um yeah comes on the on, on the on the border of longitude and latitude there on the black lines yes and uh yeah that's bjorno that's the, the bear island i was talking about mm -hmm. okay so it's a beautiful beautiful area you've been there Oh yes, oh yes, uh, I've been there uh, several times, and uh, it's yeah, Sv Svalbard is <clears throat> is unlike any other place for me because it is not just like uh, a very cold in winter, <laughs> and uh, and it does have a few very interesting features like the um, the seed vault that uh, I think we have talked about in another episode, but um, which a lot of people know of, and that's where this is. Um, it also has these old. Russian settlements that I t I'm totally in love with because they are so they're almost like a time capsule up there um, and another thing that I love about Svalbard is that uh, is how international it is how um, how many different uh, people from different nations live and work there because it is really it's a true melting pot of all sorts of different cultures and and uh, influx from everywhere it indeed is, and the reason for that is the Svalbard Treaty, and see, that's something. See the segue I gave you there. See, it's amazing. <laughs> it's really beautiful, and the Svalbard Treaty celebrates uh, its hundredth anniversary this year. So on the 9th of February, actually, um, it was celebrated in we have a uh, in Norway. This is what it exactly like. is. That the entire that's the, treaty? No, there's there's just no. one page oh, out of page it, eight and it says on top, yes. And it's like the original document, and you can see it's in, in two languages, in French on the left side and English on the right side, because it was signed in Paris. And before that, before that treaty uh, came into place, Svalbard was um, kind of a no man's land. It was called Spitsbergen back then, because the, the Dutch um, William Barnes uh, discovered it, and his... Uh, naming on the map just um, yeah came into place. Oh, so, and and for... Spitsbergen translates to pointy mountains. Indeed, yeah. And it is kind of um, like the the name for the it's the name of the main island. And back then it was thought that it's one big island. And um, very much later it was discovered that there are a couple of islands uh, connected to it as well. And the Norwegians after so this this treaty actually is called Spitsbergen Vertrag, so Spitsbergen Treaty, and later got um, renamed into Svalbard Treaty after Norway decided to uh, give it a Norwegian name, the Cold Coast Svalbard, for the whole archipelago of islands. So this is how the original document looked like. Do and we know, do we know how many islands there are? I tried to look that up. I didn't find find an, um, a number of that. It's so Spitsbergen is the main island. It's the, the the biggest piece you can see. Then you have on the top left of Spitsbergen you have um, Österland, Eastland, um, which has the largest ice cap of Europe when it comes to um, area. Um, however, it's not very thick. It has an average thickness of only two hundred three hundred meters compared to the largest ice cap in uh, Europe, which is on Iceland by volume, Vatnajökull, which is up to 800, 900 meters thick. Mm -hmm. So that's um, uh, a different different number. Um, yeah, then you have Prince Karls Vorland, uh, you have Kong Karls Island, you have the, um, oh God, how are they called? Seven, seven, oh yeah, seven islands north 
um, of um, Oostlandet, then of course the Bear Island. So it's a number of um, smaller aggregations, smaller islands and bigger islands, and they all together are named Svalbard, while the main island still is called Spitsbergen. However, if you talk to Dutch people, you have to be very careful. They still call it Spitsbergen. The, 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 I, I grew up <laughs> uh, knowing it as Spitsbergen. Cause that's in, German, in, in Germany, it's actually still um, known as Spitsbergen, yes. indeed. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okie dokie, back to the treaty. So the treaty was negotiated in uh, 1920, and we have to to remember the time, 1920, or shortly after World War I, that's a significant um, turmoil in world politics. And having such a treaty of, um, of, of a group of island that was belonging to no one, and now Norway claimed that uh, territory for itself, is a kind of a huge step. So up until 1920, Spitsbergen... Uh, slash Svalbard was used or was 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 known for its uh, rich fishing grounds. So whales and fish were there um, in abundance. So English fish uh, whalers were the first coming to Svalbard. Then Dutch whalers uh, hopped in, and Dutch whalers actually took over the place. It's a lot of of um, uh, of remains of the Dutch whaling uh, time, uh, whaling period on, on Svalbard. However, at a certain time, coaling, coal mining was um, discovered and uh, coal mines were established. 1920, there was a huge drop off the price for coal. So um, just digging up coal there was not um, profitable anymore. So everybody dropped out of that uh, coal mining. And that was the moment when Norway stepped up and just claimed um, Svalbard to uh, to its own possession, and ended up in negotiations with uh, a number of uh, countries, um, fourteen, uh, namely Denmark, France, Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, the UK, including Australia, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, and India, and the United States, and of course, if I haven't mentioned it yet, Norway. So those 14 countries came together and um, worked on this treaty. And the only way all those parties agreed to uh, transferring the sovereignty of that group of islands towards Norway was in keeping certain rights to everybody who signed that treaty. And that's kind of an essential thing of that of the treaty is that all citizens of uh, signees of that treaty are allowed to live there, are allowed to work there, to um, found and run a business. They are allowed to extract resources according to local law. And this is actually a pretty amazing outcome. If you see the times straight after World War I, in the midst of the Depression, but also when you see how long that treaty lasts, for over 100 years now, this treaty is in place. It's a tremendous um, achievement of all those countries to come up with that, but also for the treaty itself to survive for such a long time. I think there are not many contracts out there which um, sustain such a long period. And that's pretty, pretty amazing for this um, beautiful place. But of course, it also inherits a couple of challenges. And one of the major challenge <clears throat> um, is that a, a number of countries joined that um, the treaty afterwards. So we're talking about over 40 uh, countries who are currently signed that treaty. And one of the major players in Svalbard next to Norway is, you mentioned it already, Russia. So Russia started especially um, extraction um, industry in uh, in Svalbard. So they actually opened up a number of coal mines. And in fact, Russians are the second largest uh, nationality on Svalbard. There still is um, today a mining settlement called Barentsburg with roughly 400 Russians living there and working there. Mm -hmm. They even have a Russian um, uh, consulate there. So actually when you um, need to uh, apply for a visa or whatever or travel documents then this is your place to go in mm -hmm. Svalbard 
which is pretty pretty um, amazing when you consider that Svalbard is part of the Norwegian territory. So it's actually Norwegian uh, territory. <laughs> it's it's interesting. I've been there. I've actually visited the coal mine. Even I had a, a tour <laughs> in the coal mine. Um, it's a very different place when you go there. Barnsberg is, uh, as I said, it's it's like a time capsule, like a Soviet time capsule in many respects, including a Lenin statue and uh, different other things there. Um, from a photographic point of view, and I'm a photographer, it is it is a, quite a treat to go there. But it's yeah, from a historical how, how... perspective as well. Yes, yes I mean yes. you can, you can visit the the um, abandoned settlements like Pyramid and and, and Grumand. Yes, but when you go to Barentsburg and you see people still living it's in that living, environment, it's a living, it's, breathing place. People go into the is. mine, and by the way, that mine doesn't go straight down; it goes into <laughs> the mountain. So it's an is a horizontal mine, and then inside the mountain, it kind of dips down, but. Um, the, the the mine entrance is looks like a sim simple office building, nothing special. But then you go there, and uh, all of a sudden you are in this completely different world. It was it was quite an uh, an experience to be there. Yes, it definitely. Is. So you, you get in touch with a complete different, uh, not only culture but a, di a, a different time. It really maintains a lot of the of the Soviet era in uh, that settlement, and. Russia has a very certain approach to um, to that treaty. So they, they joined the treaty because of um, of geopolitical um, considerations, not so much about the um, economic considerations, but that's also one of the major reasons why they are still um, using the mine, why they're operating the mine in, in Barentsburg, is to actually have a reason to be there to, to to have a foot in the door or on the territory if you like that's also the reason why even though they abandoned the places uh, pyramid and agreement they never really abandoned them they <laughs> no, still they have didn't. one or two people there who are staying over the winter and just um just occupying it because if it's, they didn't they would lose the place right exactly yeah and and that's just kind of a hilarious uh, approach, but it's a very serious approach at the same time. So the Spitsbergen Treaty um, not only says that Svalbard is completely controlled uh, by the Kingdom of Norway, it also says that everybody who signs the treaty, the citizen of those countries, have the ch have the, the abilities to um, live and work there, and they have a non discrimination um, paragraph in the treaty that means that all citizens and all companies of the nations that signed that treaty are not only allowed to become residents of Svalbard they have full access to Svalbard including all the rights to the resources and that means fishing coal hunting everything mining hmm. this it, it doesn't doesn't matter what kind of resources you have access to all the resources and for quite some time um mining for coal was very lucrative was very um very uh, good for uh from an economic point of view that's not the the case anymore the efforts to operate the mine in an arctic environment is quite significant compared to the price you can gain for uh, coal that's one of the reasons why norway for example shut down all the mines they used to operate so even the largest mine on the on the um, group of islands uh, Sveagruva was just closed and now Barnsburg is in fact the last um, industrial operated mine that's still uh, operated that's still in use hmm. so that has changed enormously and However, wh wh why are they why are, why are they keeping the other mining towns uh, still active is that because it might it might come in handy in the future because we are looking at uh, climate change and we are looking at the Arctic um, maybe thawing a bit more and then that could uh, in turn mean that th it's easier to extract those resources or what do you definitely think? considerations I'm I'm sure about that the the other part is also when you yeah, when you see the places when when you visit it um, Pyramiden yeah you, you've seen all those big blocks they have there all the uh, the rigs for for the mine and uh, for the, the the carts to carry the coal down to the That's harbor. An investment. It's a huge investment, and yeah. just 
um, defunctioning it, just um, rebuilding it costs a lot of money. So they just decided to l let it in place. Not sure if they ever going to use that again, but it's part of their um, belong belonging. So basically they have a company that um, still operates all of that, other, which all of that stuff belongs to. So it's kind of geopolitics behind that. It's partly um, economical, but I think mainly they just want to keep control over what they created what they just um built up there mm -hmm. i think that's the the, the, the main key or the key driver if, if you will but then we we see kind of a militarization in the arctic growing up again so after the cold war we had a huge demilitarization um the arctic w was turning into something uh like a peaceful research playground suddenly the with the with the retreat of the sea ice, but also with uh, melting permafrost, with more accessibility and so on, that gives more access to resources, and by that you also see that um, geopolitical tensions are growing um, up again, and by that also of course militarization, and we can see that particularly in in that area by um, by Russia, which just. A few days ago, started a huge maneuver in the Barents Sea slash Norwegian Sea. So oh, wow. actually, between between um, Svalbard and Norway, so it's it's the sea actually straight between um, Svalbard and northern Norway. You can can see that where where you have the edge of the of the shelf where it goes deeper into the trench, pretty much in the center of the picture. Mm -hmm. So in in that area. A fleet of over 40 vassals is um, just operating uh, a huge maneuver. Of course, a fully defensive maneuver, but they're just have they, they have um, one of the newest uh, missile cruisers in the um, in the maneuver. At the same time, they uh, the Russians invented this huge, huge um, military uh, weapon, this supersonic missile, um, which just freshly got stationed. In, in the Arctic, and uh, namely on an airfield base in Franz Josef Land, which is very close to to Svalbard. When you see Svalbard in the in the center of the of the map, you just see the um, almost dotted line at 80 degree, and when you um, follow that to the right, the ice covered group of smaller islands there. That's Franz Josef Land, and having their military uh, presence is kind of it's not necessarily threatening um, the sovereignty of Svalbard, but the the measures in total that's taken by Russia, the way Russia is communicating to Norway, addressing that they don't accept the way Norway is, um, or not sympathizing with, with the way Norway is handling the um, the, the, the the matters of, of uh, Svalbard, is just at least concerning. It's raising concerns there. So we have within hmm. the Svalbard Treaty a number of regulations. And for example, um, even though everybody has on this non-discrimination clause the possibility uh, to the access of the resources, Norway still has the, uh, the, the possibility that the uh, that Norwegian law applies to Svalbard and Norway has the right to, um, to set... Um, reservation areas or nature reserves or so and Norway just um, created kind of a marine not marine protected area but um, a, f a fishery regulated area around Svalbard so you're actually not just allowed to, to fish everywhere without uh, certain permits. Russia is, um, is not accepting that and still doing their own thing, just stating they signed the treaty, the treaty said everybody has access to the resources, and here comes the geological fight into place, where some scientists say um, Svalbard belongs to the uh, continental shelf of Norway, and some say it has its own continental shelf. Why is that important? Because if it belongs to the continental shelf of Norway, then the Norwegian exclusive economic area just comes into play, which is yeah, in, in world economics and maritime law, um, an interesting and important factor. It means that um, the country is the only one who exclusively has access to the um, to the resources in the sea and the sea floor. In I think 
a three miles radius and from there on in a 10 mile radius i think and after that you have a 200 nautical mile zone and if the continental shelf of Svalbard is not connected to the one of Norway, then we have a complete own continental shelf of uh, Svalbard. And that means that that continental shelf could be part of the Svalbard Treaty, meaning that the access not only to the resources in the ocean around Svalbard, but also to the resources in the seabed around Svalbard, namely oil and gas, can be exploited by every signy country of the Svalbard Treaty. And Norway tries to, to avoid that, of course, for several understandable reasons. One, of course, is an economic reason. You don't want to have someone else exploiting your own resources. The other is that Norway has undertaken quite some measures recently to protect um, the uh, group of islands of, of Svalbard in a uh, very fashionable manner with uh, a number of regulations that not only applies for tourists but mainly for industries and this is a pretty um pretty interesting development recent development of a hundred years old uh, old contract so um has the svalbard treaty been changed in any way on the during those last 100 years or has it just been like that that's the interesting thing. It's probably the only contract, it's the only contract I know which hasn't changed at all, where there were no amendments, no renegotiations, no changes. It just stays as it was negotiated because at, at any time, everybody reads out of that contract kind of what it wants to, to a certain degree. <laughs> <laughs> so so what's the reason it has held up so long is it because it just has been difficult to extract resources up there and that's why people just went there and and i i think tourism is a, is a big factor up there right now and it doesn't hurt the 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 the, the archipelago too much as opposed to there are uh, exploiting the the resources there are a couple of tumors coming up so norway tries to regulate right now also um, the use for example of New Orleans. New Orleans is the northernmost permanent uh, settlement settlement we have in, in Svalbard, mm -hmm. which is basically a huge research village. Uh, not huge, it's a, a large <laughs> it's a research, research village. village. <laughs> yeah. You have an, you have a number of research stations that also sounds a little bit big. It's a couple of huts and um, people And it are... also has the world's northernmost post office. That's true. Mm -hmm. And um, Norway tries to regulate that this area is entirely dedicated to science and only to a certain amount or a certain fields of science. And China, for example, is disputing that and just says, well, what we are doing with our research station is our thing. If we want to research law in uh, New Orleans, mm -hmm. then we just research law here. And Norway tries to avoid that and just says, no, 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 it has to be related to the Arctic, it has to be related to environment, to um, cryosphere, to geology, whatever, but it has to be related to that place and not to just random field of topics. And China also disputes that they can't um, do tourism, for example, out of their uh, base, which is not according to the treaty or not according to the, the, the ideas Norway has uh, about the treaty. And that's um, like, yeah, that's a, a play with every every contract, with any contract, any uh, kind of uh, agreement that when you have written down a passage, there are a number of ways to interpret that passage. And that probably is kind of the success story of the, of the treaty is that it's formulated in a way that it gives enough space for um, interpretations that you actually have uh, the sovereignty of Norway and nobody is disputing that but at the same time uh, disputing certain regulations uh, that Norway tries to um, install in, in Svalbard and just doing uh, their own thing based on their interpretation of the treaty. So if you would just leave that treaty you would have more disadvantages than advantages. Uh, that's um, that's the, the the easy equation, I think, and that's the the success uh, the success story of of that treaty. The other thing uh, that particularly Norway tries to 
uh, reinforce is the dematerialization of the of the area, just keeping uh, arms and weapons out of of Svalbard. So for for Norway, that's um, and and we're talking military weapons because you have to have a gun because of the polar bears. Yes. Yeah. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Keeping the military out of um, out of uh, Svalbard. So uh, for, for Norway, the interpretation of the um, Svalbard Treaty is very very clear to be a demilitarized zone within the Arctic. And um, apparently, the understanding of the Norwegian government um, of the Arctic is the Arctic as a demilitarized zone, and that's um, a very favorable um, understanding, a very nice idea, which I would uh, highly support. All right. Do we have any, or do you have any idea where this will go? Is that Svalbard Treaty just going to stay around forever? Or are there any any plans for its future? Or is it, are, are all the different countries trying to navigate within it and around it um, and still do their own thing? It's a lot of factors that come into play. And I would really love to talk to uh, geopolitics analyst to, to, um, about that. Mm -hmm. But what we can see is that the tensions between Russia and Norway are, are growing. So Russia has sent um, a very unfavorable uh, letter to, um, to the Nor uh, Norwegian government um, just prior to the ceremonies of the 100th anniversary of the treaty, um, where they're just disputing certain regulations or certain ideas of um, of the way Norway's uh, Norway's interpreting the uh, the treaty. So the the multilateral dimension of that treaty just inherits uh, a number of um, uncertainties. It makes it really difficult to to uh, predict the future of that treaty. I hope sincerely that. The, the way the treaty has unfolded in the past hundred years continues in a way that we see that Svalbard has become um, a, a melting pot for um, explorers to, uh, which just uh, settled in, in Longyearbyen and just started to do their own business, um, which has become uh, a centerpiece of Arctic research, of climate research in, in New Orleans. Um, where, by the way, also the very first uh, crossing of the North Pole and the Arctic Sea by airship took place from uh, Roald Amundsen, uh, which is uh, pretty amazing in, uh, back in the time. So when you go to New Orleans, you still can visit the, the mast the, um, the airship was um, towed to. Which is an interesting, which was a very interesting moment because um, when we were there, I, I knew about the mast, I kind of knew about its history. Um, but I was kind of the only one who was just interested to go close and see it with my own eyes. Uh, most of really? the people, yes, yes, really. So um, I found, and, and I found it very a very uplifting moment to be close to such a historic uh, a structure. I have to say, when I was there the first time, um, so for us, when we visit New Orleans, it's kind of of a mandatory visit with the guests to go there and tell the story and. Yes. Every guide has a different approach. I remember um, a colleague of mine, uh, Michelle, she is amazing with the stories of the wives of the explorers or the women, the affairs. And she she was talking about the affairs of Roald Amundsen after she just talked about the um, the expedition or exploration um, itself. Uh, then we have a, a number of people who are really into history and really into numbers and that can just really tell the story. So for me, every time I'm there, the whole place comes to life. It's just really you can feel the the uh, things that happen there. You can um, you get an idea of how busy that place used to be with an airship and what kind of effort to build that there and in they, such a harsh climate. And they um, there's also some more museum activity, so you can get some a better historic perspective when being there. And uh, yeah, it is a very a very historic place. Definitely, it is, and um, that's thanks to to that treaty. So for for me personally, I really hope that um, the developments are getting a bit quieter again, but that it um, continues to develop Svalbard into the uh, peaceful uh, research um, purpose that Norway sees, and that 
and yeah that we still can explore the area with um with tourists and that we can just show them um the, the, the beauty of that place but also the impacts we can see new orleans in for example it's a wonderful research station for how the how the ocean currents change how the uh, ecosystem within the ocean currents change so it's um within the kongs fjord and in that fjord we can actually uh, research how certain fish species are changing so the the arctic cot disappearing traveling further north because the water gets too warm and the atlantic uh, atlantic cot much much bigger just travels north that changes um, of course the fishery purposes further south so in in norway in the lofoten or around tromsø the uh, fishery is not that productive anymore because the cot just travels further north so does that mean that the fishery has to travel to to Svalbard? Is that good for Svalbard? Is it not good? All those implications have to be researched, and um, New Orleans is the the hub for that, is the centerpiece for that. And just strolling through that um, to that village with tourists and just being able to introduce them randomly uh, to to scientists who are working there is just a pretty amazing thing to do. Yes. So I'm a re a really really am glad about this. Uh, treatment uh, treaty and i'm really happy that it survived for that long so i hope for the next hundred years all right and i guess that wraps it up thank you so much for bringing us this uh, us this information um even if it was a bit of a repeat um it was a repeat from a different perspective and uh, that's always worth something especially since we now have video so if you have listened to this episode uh, make sure to follow the link in the show notes to the youtube version of this episode you can see both of us goofing off in front of the camera and uh, showing you maps at the same time and things um, you can also tell us what you think about our episode um, is there a topic that you think we should cover uh, do you want to get a deeper insight or an update on a previous topic um, always happy to do this especially when it's relevant like the 100 years of the Svalbard Treaty today and uh, you can of course write us an email to info at curiouslypolar.com that's also our website curiouslypolar.com we're on Twitter at curiouslypolar and on Instagram at curiouslypolar and um, that's it for today. We'll be back in approximately two weeks. Until then, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>